Um, hi, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm George Neville Neal. I am a graduate student. That's, that was supposed to get a bigger laugh. Anyway, uh, I am actually a graduate student, crazily enough. And this is uh, research I've been doing with my advisors, Robert Soleil, Peter Alvaro, um, another graduate, Stelios, and uh, Avi Silvershots. And uh, so this is called OSDB, Turning the Tables on Kernel Data. So this is a general slide that you probably don't need. Wow, I got it, like this, this far up? It feels rude. <laughs> anyway, um, y'all don't probably need to see this one since you actually understand operating systems, but later this year, the paper that we wrote got accepted to a database conference where I have to explain to database people how operating systems work. Uh, so I think we can get past this, but we all know that the OS is basically system calls and stuff, OS state and stuff, and device driver stuff. Uh, and these, these uh, stacks are not to scale because 60% of FreeBSD is device drivers. <clears throat> and if we, didn't have open Z, if we didn't have ZFS in the kernel, it'd be 80%. So all those other things in that FreeBSD book that that guy wrote, it's mostly device drivers. Um, so part of what motivated this work, well, I should probably face the cameras. Part of what motivated this work was to try and think about um, how we could use uh, databases and database technology for telemetry. So what were some of the use cases we came up with? Well, this is a classic one. You run a program and you get e-adder in use. And then you're like, oh, on this really busy server, who is sitting on that port? And <clears throat> everyone in this room, of course, knows the answer, which is, you know, PS plus this plus grep plus whatever. And if you're on Linux, you can do LSOF. But if you're on FreeBSD, you do something else. Um, but this led us to a bunch of questions, right? So if you are not someone who has spent the last however many years doing operating systems and you are presented with a, a problem with operating system state, state in the operating system, how do you find that out? What do you do? Um, do you use PS? Do you use Netstat? How do you find a manual page? And now that I'm doing graduate work and I'm actually helping undergraduates and young graduate students to do OS research, these questions come up all the time because they don't spend their lives diddling around with POSIX-like operating systems. They spend their time in other places. Uh, soon they'll be spending their time on AI. But let's not think about that. So, and then what are the options? I love this. It's like, is it PS minus EF? Is it AUX? Is it something else? How many options are there to LS, as Kirk mentioned yesterday? Um, we have this, and so we have this set of commands, this ad hoc set of commands that have been developed over the last 50 years to extract state from the kernel. And then what do we extract it as? Strings. Wow. <laughs> That's great. So then what do you do? Then you run grep, and then you run awk, and then you run something else to try and actually get something out of it. So you have an operating system kernel that we've built with, we collectively have built, with real structure in it. And then you remove all of that structure and you turn it into a string and you throw it in a user space and good luck. Um, so trying to figure out what's going on becomes a text processing job, which turns out was what Unix was originally written for, text processing. <clears throat> um, and then there's a lack of what database people call join. So uh, let's see, on the left I have the output of PS and on the right I have the output of Netstat, right? And how do I try and correlate data from the networking stack coming out of Netstat with data about processes coming out of the process table. Well, at the moment, I do it with awk, a, a tool that is older than half the room and almost as old as I am. So there's this lack of join. You can't really look at the data structures in the kernel and say, oh, I know that this and this column of data are related. Show me what happens when I join them. And to database people, that's really important. And it's a very powerful component of relational algebra and databases. And it's amusing, I'm gonna say this in this crowd, I will not say this to the database people, I have hated databases my entire career. I think they are the most boring structures you are ever going to use, and really I never wanted to program them, and now they're part of my thesis, so karma sucks. Um, all right, so what, what was the observation? Why did we do this work? So the kernel is a database, right? There's a whole bunch of data structures in the kernel that look exactly like what a database person would call a table. They're generally lists of structures, um, C structures. And the really nice thing in FreeBSD, and I have not looked at the kernel port that's being done by someone else on, um, for this stuff on Linux, um, is that they're almost all in one file. Everything in Q.h 
lists, tail queues, all of those things, that's just a table because it's just a list of structures and every single structure is a tuple in the table and it all just looks like that. Um, so this, the kernel actually is a database. It has many different tables in it um, with an awful API. Right? So, oh, I needed to get at this thing. Oh, I added another system call. Oh, I need to get this thing. I added another system call. So now we have 500 system calls in FreeBSD to extract this data from the operating system kernel, data that is actually in a nice natural format for processing. But then we turn it into strings, and then we put it in user space, and then we tell people good luck. So what did we do? Um, well, we did this. Oh, and I get to hand these out now. Now, if you are allergic to peanuts, don't eat these. <laughs> okay? <laughs> we'll make the warning now. Um, but uh, for those of you who are old enough to remember the commercial, you got your chocolate on my peanut butter, or you got your operating system on my database. No, you have your database in my operating system, and this is what we did. Um, yeah, it even has a moving GIF. Terrifying. Um, but there's this natural tension between the way operating system developers op develop operating systems and the way database people view databases. Databases are top down. You state your constraints at the beginning. The database will operate in this way, locking, which database locking and what we do for locking are different, and I'll mention that later. How you lock records, how you deal with um, various problems of constraints in the database is a top-down problem. That's how database people have thought about this for the last, however, 50 years. Um, and also, the one nice thing that the database people have is they have math. So relations are real mathematical things. Uh, operating systems don't have math. Uh, operating systems are bottom-up, which is, good luck with that hardware. <laughs> like, oh, here's a new platform. I hope you can make your operating system that looks like a PDP-11 run on it again. Um, and they have to handle asynchrony. Like, now, databases developed by people like Oracle, not that I want to mention that word, um, but databases that run directly on hardware and not on top of an operating system obviously need to solve the operating system problems, right? They need to deal with asynchrony. But operating systems writ large, like FreeBSD, that's what we do all day, right? All we do is like, oh, crap, a packet came in, and now I've got to react to it. Um, and database people don't really think about this when they're designing their systems. So when we took the two, when we took the chocolate and the peanut butter and we put them in the same cup, um, we had to handle these problems. So how does this look visually? Well, this is the operating system view of the world. <laughs> and uh, it's like, oh, okay, well, keep all the plates flying, and if one of them falls, it's a panic. And then this is the database view of the world. You've got this nice regular data, and it comes in, and you can extract it. And the other nice thing, and there's a great talk by one of my advisors, Peter Alvaro, um, at Strange Loop a bunch of years ago, where he pointed out in databases, the time is always now. And you can stop a database. Now, people using it would get really annoyed, but it will not destroy the constraints of the database to stop the database for some period of time and do an operation. Try that in the US kernel. That's not very bad. I mean, we stop it for very short periods of time. Um, so we have this tension between these two ways of thinking about it. So, is that, yep, that's what I wanted. Okay, so what did we want to do? So we wanted to basically take this thing called the operating system and evolve it so that the state of the operating system could be investigated instead of with ad hoc mechanisms or with strings using a query language. And of course, in databases, SQL is the query language. So how do we make it so that people can look at the state of the system via SQL and then not only look at the state, but actually be able to update the state? So I'll talk about how we did that. So some implementation details. Um, I don't know which one of these is peanut butter and which one is chocolate. I happen to like chocolate better, so therefore FreeBSD is chocolate and SQLite is peanut butter, but whichever way you look at it. Um, we took SQLite, which is an embeddable SQL database used in, it turns out, everything. Like, you build Python, SQLite's in it. You build uh, LLDB, GDB, like a lot of things just have SQLite built in, except operating system kernels, uh, for a bunch of reasons. So we had to port SQLite into FreeBSD, and then we used, uh, it has this thing called foreign tables. I'll talk about that in a moment because it's key to how we did this. 
but we made it run in the in the FreeBSD kernel. We have a uh, fork. No, fork. We have a branch of uh, FreeBSD, and we had to make some changes to SQLite, but not that many. Um, you all know what FreeBSD is. So, virtual tables. So, what do we want to do? We know that these lists and these structures. And I'll talk a lot about the process list because it's a really easy example. Um, although. <laughs> Can anybody guess how many rows are in struct proc? <laughs> John, John did that. That's great. It's, it's not 100. It's only 98. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. There are 98 columns if you were to expose the entire uh, row of each struct proc. Um, so virtual tables are these things. And it's actually a general concept in databases, but they're supported, well supported in SQLite where Instead of having to have a real table backed by a B tree structure, which is how SQLite stores its real tables, if you're in SQLite and you're like, create table foo with this, you get a B tree. But you can play this little magical game <clears throat> where you have a set of methods and you can expose struct proc. You notice I only have the first four elements <laughs> as a table. And then you can do all the things that SQL allows you to do. You can select, you can join, and you can update. So what we don't do, and I think I'll talk about it now instead of later, is we don't replace the process table with a database table. In fact, Mike Stonebreaker, who did some work on databases at some point, or won a Turing Award, I don't know, some guy uh, from Berkeley, uh, has proposed actually replacing operating systems purely with a query engine for a database. Like, I don't need an operating system, I just have this database thing. Um, he's wrong but I don't get to tell him that until January uh, when he's probably gonna ask some really hard questions. So we didn't replace any of the tables in the kernel with SQLite database tables. We simply expose those data structures as if they are tables. So, then we have this problem of locking. <laughs> Cause you know, it'd be really bad if in the middle of some update, uh, you know, some other part of the kernel which was also running did something bad. And we have two types of locking, right? So everyone's really familiar with this. Everyone in this room is really familiar with this. You can lock the process table. You can lock the TCP sockets. You can lock the file system. You can lock a vnode. Um, but then you also have to worry about the database itself because you have in databases the same problem of time of check to time of use, right? I went and I looked at some piece of data and now I'm gonna make a decision based on it what if the data changed? And I'll talk about how we handled that. Um, for the operating system locking, we simply exploited all the locks that FreeBSD already has, because those are all correct, um, I hope. Uh, and we just followed the same locking discipline. So we lock the process table using the same thing that everything else in the kernel locks the process table with. We do one little trick, um, well, a couple little tricks. One of the things that we do is, currently when we want to get data from the kernel, we lock, we grab all of the locks that we possibly can, and we, <laughs> I should not watch John while I'm doing this, and then we snapshot the data so that the queries don't actually operate on live data. They operate on data a few milliseconds ago, and that, that's safer. So we respect the existing kernel locks, because if we didn't, the kernel would panic. Um, and then we do the snapshotting technique, right? So when we take a snapshot, I think the screen doesn't like me. When we take a snapshot, we get a, what we call a transactionally consistent view of the kernel state. And this is really useful for a bunch of reasons. One is, um, so if you think about the way that we currently interrogate the kernel, usually we're doing it through a pipeline, which means that each program runs independently and sends its output to another program. So if I were to look at the process table, then the socket table, then this table, then this table, each one of those things would be grabbed milliseconds apart. By doing it all in the kernel, it's much faster and we get a much finer granularity of, of snapshots. Things are much more correlated. Um, and then the other nice thing about snapshots is we get this straightforward time series over the state. So some people have tried to do this in user space. There's something called OS Query which runs on Linux. And it sucks all the stuff out in text and then it munges the text and then it gives you, it uses SQLite as well because everyone uses SQLite um, to do this in user space. But what we have are snapshots in the kernel. So every time you do a query, you get a snapshot. 
course, we added a routine that's like, you know, every however many ticks or whatever you want to do, take a snapshot of the state so that you can then walk backwards, right? You can be like, oh, what happened to this socket over time? Or what happened to this process over time? And you don't have to run a bunch of user level code. You're doing it all in the kernel. It's a, you know, it's a, not round robin. Um, it's a ring. So we don't eat all of the kernel to memory, although the initial <clears throat> implementation did. So uh, I fixed that. But uh, now you can define, you know, oh, I'd like 100 snapshots, 1,000 snapshots, whatever. If you're on a server, you can have a lot of snapshots. Um, but anyway, any read-only query over a snapshot or across snapshots is what we call serializable. And this is a database-y thing. So, but we have this time of check to time of use problem, right? So I do a query and I'm like, oh, well, uh, so for instance, which process is using the most network resources defined as, you know, the amount of uh, messages sent by R in, in the R usage block in the thread. Um, well, of course, if something's active, every time you take a snapshot, it's gonna change. So you have to make this decision of, because in databases, the way they would do it is they'd be like, I take a snapshot and I take a second snapshot and I do a hash over the two and if the hash is matched, then nothing changed and I can move forward with my update operation. This is only for updates uh, or deletions, not for reads. But of course, going back to our earlier slide, operating systems change constantly and they are asynchronous. Right? It's not like time can ever stop. So we have to make decisions about the data that we expose to the user, whether or not that data can be used in certain routines. Now, at the moment, because we're only exposing the kernel data structures and not replacing them with tables, with true tables, um, we can also make it so that the methods, like update and delete, use the kernel's routines. So for instance, I have a, I think I've got this in here, but there's something in the paper where we're like, oh, well, now we have a network killer. So everyone knows what the out-of-memory killer is, right? So when something uses too much memory, the kernel's like, oh, by the way, uh, Oh, that was loud. Um, but we don't have that for networking. So what if something is eating the entire network? And that never happens, Netflix. <clears throat> Uh, on, on anything on FreeBSD, so how would we do that? Well, we could do the thing of directly manipulating the process table, but that's not what we do. We use the kernel's internal, effectively the equivalent of kill, right, to be like kill, because that means that all of the lock, the kernel locking is taken care of by someone else. Um, but we still have this time of check to time of use for the database itself. And we do what's called optimistic, opportunistic concurrency control. This is a fairly old, idea, I think the paper is from the 80s, and the idea is that in systems that don't have a huge amount of change, not operating systems, um, you take it exactly what we, we've been talking about the whole time. You take a, a, a snapshot, you take a second snapshot, you compare them. They have a bunch of different ways of doing it in the paper. The paper's quite long. Um, we do it simply, we're like snapshot, hash, snapshot, hash, compare, and then we decide which columns of data, which is which parts of the tuple, which is which parts of the C structure, are acceptable, right? And at the moment, we're working through a lot of that. So, this is kind of what I just said. Um, basic OCC is the queries execute over a fresh snapshot, and then before committing, the database people say commit, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, you mean before calling kill. Um, we check changes, and then we, if, if they exist, we abort. Um, uh, and we do a lot of this for the obvious reason. So as a room full of OS developers, when we say something like, I'm going to take a lock, it's not this, right? It's like, oh, there's a mutex. I'm going to hold that until I'm done. Um, if we did that in our system, the kernel would panic because we'd hold locks way too long. You just couldn't, couldn't do it. Uh, so this is why we operate only on snapshots. Um, and then this very last line is the, the important thing about dynamism. And one of the things we're looking at as the research continues is what are the right ways to handle what I call volatile data, although this seems to update the database people because it means something different for them. Um, but basically, asynchronous data or, for instance, time. Right? Databases can use timestamps, but they're not driven by them. Operating systems are driven by time. Right? Every single tick, there is another counter. And so you can never include a timestamp, even though we use timestamps in our tables, 
as part of the OCC because it will always change. Then you would never be able to do an update. So um, <laughs> uh, the first table we exposed because it provided a lot of uh, places to mess around um, is the process table because I mean, you can kill things and you can find things and you can look at the threads and you can find a whole bunch of data about the table. So um, in any POSIX-like operating system, uh, including FreeBSD, the process table is the cent central point for a tr tremendous amount of information about everything going on in the system. In fact, the reason that there are 98 entries in struct proc is half the time when you add a new feature, it winds up in proc. You're like, oh, where are we gonna put that proc? Um, now it's like thread, but it used to be proc. So we started looking at the process table. It's the one thing to rule them all and in the kernel bind them. Um, so what does this look like? So for those of you who don't speak SQL, it's not that hard. Um, it is really ugly. Like you think COBOL's ugly? SQL is COBOL ugly, man. And it's, you can now use lowercase, so that's nice, but generally keywords in SQL are lowercase. And this is just show me all the processes. So um, we've got this, uh, it's, it's not the full PS minus AUWX blah, blah, blah. We've got some of the data here. Um, but one of the cool things is we've got timestamps right in the snapshot. And that makes a lot of analysis easier because each snapshot is timestamped and then we can do time series. Um, but this should look familiar to anyone who's ever done PS. Um, so for instance, one of the, the first things I brought up was, well, how do you find out who's got an open socket? So normally you'd use several programs, you'd run a pipeline, uh, young people would use Python, old people would use awk, and then cranky young people who are here would use awk, because that's what we're like. Um, but how would you answer this question in SQL? Now, I'm not gonna say this is beautiful, because it is not beautiful, but it is one line, and it is joining tables that until now could not be joined without going back into user space and through awk, or Python, or whatever. Um, but because we've put this query engine into the kernel and exposed the set of tables, we can cross-reference, think of a join as a cross-reference, the process table, the TCP sockets, and the files. And that will then tell us the answer to our question, right? Who's sitting on my, who's sitting on my port? Um, I mean, this is just an idle uh, VM doing this. So one line instead of a pipeline, and also uh, I'll show something interesting, faster. <clears throat> so that's telemetry, that's reading the data. And then I talked about, you know, how do we do things like updates or deletes. Um, we talked about writes are only allowed where they don't volatate, violate the operating system state. So for instance, we never want to do something that causes there to be two of the same PID, because that would be bad. Um, or two of the same socket structure with the same tuple. Um, so we want to be able to do things like, in the process table again, which is our, our first example that we went through, um, deleting a process in the process table should be the same as killing a process, right? So we can say delete from all procs where the PID is this. And that tells SQL, tells the virtual table implementation in the kernel, call this routine, we know that does the right thing. It's, it's kill routine, yes? Okay, wow. I'm, I feel this is very intimate. <laughs> well, look, dude, you're like, you know, anyway. <clears throat> I, I don't even know this microphone. Um, so, yeah, all right. So I'll try, to, I'll try to stick with this. Anyway, so you can delete. <laughs> so we can delete from all procs, and all procs is a list of all the processes. Where the pit is this. Um, but this is our one-liner for killing a network abuser, right? So... This is delete from all procs where the PID is this, and then we select, and this is all typical SQL. You can go and do a search online for how would I do this kind of thing in SQL, and that's what I have to do because I never took a database class. <clears throat> um, and then it's like, okay, well, you know, let's see, what is this? Where the PID is greater than 1,000, so it's not, a secure, not in the secure group, and it sent more than 10,000 messages in the last second, right? Unix Epic is part of SQL. Um, and this is how we kill a misbehaving network process. This gives us the out-of-network killer. And I didn't have to add a ton of things to the kernel. I just had to add the small amount of code that we added for uh, OSDB. 
So another classic problem, and uh, John will enjoy this because we spent our, I don't know how many years at making things do this. Um, every once in a while, or pretty much every morning, um, someone puts two processes on the same core that shouldn't be there. <laughs> and then you're like, oh, the tail latency just went <laughs> How'd that happen? Um, so two processes may accidentally compete for a single resource. CPU is the one that we looked at for this particular paper. Um, finding and moving such a process is arduous, um, especially arduous when the ops group is screaming at you uh, while you're trying to fix it. So again, we can do this in a single command because now we've exposed not only the process table but the thread table. Um, so our test for this, which is a nice simple test, is to run a couple of network perfs. iperf is a network perf test. We run the server. We, on purpose, put them both on the same core because we're trying to test this. And then we make our, um, we make our SQL query do the, do the work. Find the two things that are eating this and move it. Uh, again, I make no claims to the beauty of SQL. Uh, but the fact that this is one line instead of a pipeline of multiple scripting languages uh, is pretty powerful. What was that? Yeah, that's right. yeah there's that. Actually, it's the, the thing that makes a pipeline in, in SQL, and it's not a pipeline, but it's the select with the select with the select. You're like, oh. Uh, that's why I'm glad I work for someone who actually knows how to do this. Uh, so what's the performance overhead of this? How much do you pay? So this is something we thought was really interesting. Now we assumed um, putting a database in the kernel and wrapping some, uh, wrapping some tables and some structures and adding extra locking because we had to lock the tables while we were extracting the snapshot, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We thought this would be really expensive. And um, we just sort of assumed that throwing more code in the kernel wasn't gonna be fast. Now it's not faster, but it's not as much slower, even by a long shot, than we thought. And so. What we've been using is Unix Bench, and I would like to make a side comment since this is a Unix group of people. Um, you know how old this stupid thing is? Like, a hobbyist magazine in 1983 came up with the benchmark we're all still using, and this is wrong, but I am not fixing this in my PhD. Someone else has to do a PhD to fix this. But we, used, we use Unix Bench for this. We have these big servers with 72 cores. Um, what we found is, and what we looked at was, since we have a thing where we can say, collect samples at a certain rate, what is the overhead of collecting all of those samples? So um, the sampling frequency goes along the bottom. We've got 10 to the one, 10 to two, whatever. Um, even out to here, these dots don't move. Right? There's just very little overhead in collecting the snapshots, in part because we're not crossing the, the um, user kernel boundary a huge amount, but also in part because it turns out People who implement just databases understand data structures a little bit, <clears throat> and their code is relatively efficient and also operating on numbers. And it turns out computers really like numbers, and they hate strings. Um, and I'll show a graph that shows that very clearly. Uh, and then we tried, uh, what we tried to do, <laughs> so when you're doing this kind of research, you're like, okay, well, it's great that one of the however many tests are in Unix bench. You know, all, a whole bunch of these are like, there's no overhead. But you can't write a paper that says that. So you're like, okay, let's find the worst possible benchmark to put in the paper, which is what this is. Um, and we found that there's this thing that executes a whole bunch of shells in parallel, just because in 1983, executing shells in parallel was expensive for Byte Magazine, I don't know. Um, anyway, so the single core score does get worse as the number of shells increases. Um, and you can see that here, that's the blue. Um, but if you're using all the cores in parallel and you actually fill all the cores, you still don't have a huge amount of um, overhead. And this is sampling from one to 100 hertz. So here's the interesting bit. There we go. Um, we ran a test where we started thousands and thousands of processes. And we're like, okay, well, if we just do the simple thing of like select star from all procs or PS minus blah, 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 um, and we manipulated the we used the arguments to PS that gave output that looked like we were getting an OSDB, like we sorted it in, this, in a particular way and we were able to get them to match. Um, the red line is PS. And this is how much worse PS gets as you get up to, I guess we went to about 7,000 processes. Um, and you've got this, it's not exponential, 
I'm not a mathematician, but I asked a mathematician and he said it's super linear. I'm like, okay, fine, it's super linear. Um, but it's not good, right? And why is that? Because this is not an expected result, right? You shoved a bunch of code in the kernel and you didn't really optimize it in particular. You just used it and it's faster. How on earth does that happen? Well, I say that in the next, uh, no, I don't. I have to say that verbally. Um, there's a couple of things. First of all, what does PS do? It sorts a bunch of strings. So if you ask PS to sort, it sucks all the text up into user space and then it runs sort on it, runs QSort on it. And if you do, if you use PMC, which is what I did to look this up, it's like, oh, that's hot. And you're like, oh, that's a bummer. Um, because it's operating on the, I would now argue, the wrong kind of data. OSDB, because it's using SQL, and the things in the table are numbers, can actually sort more quickly. And so almost all of this overhead is sorting strings. And that's why this is linear, I asked the mathematician, and this is super linear. So it was just an interesting bit we got out of that, that if you operate on the kernel's native data types, integers, which is most of what's in the kernel because we don't even allow float, but that's a different discussion, um, then you actually get better performance. So what, are we, what else are we gonna do with this? Um, there is, uh, I'll share the slides, there's, if you haven't had enough of me speaking, there is an eight minute demo of me demoing how all of this works um, online uh, in a little video that I made. And then, so what are we gonna do next? So, well, currently we have seven tables, which took all of 4,500 lines of C. We were able to expose all of that now. That doesn't count the SQLite code, right? But we didn't modify SQLite. The modifications we made are 4,500 lines of code. And every new table is about 200 lines depending on the size of the table and how much we wanted to do. In fact, as of this morning, one of the undergraduates we're working with, we've got two of them working on the project, um, was able to add a table for NFS. So for those of you who saw my questions on, on net about, hey, there's all these get adders, what's going on? Well, that was driven in part by teaching all of the folks how to do kernel development and build out of tree kernel modules because we had this weird freeze. And then we took one, of, we said to one of the undergraduates for their, uh, it's a 490 project, for, for their undergraduate project. We're like, why don't you try to figure out how this, you know, what's broken and try to figure it out the old fashioned way, which took weeks because it's like, oh, collect the NFS stats, collect the PCAP, have GNN read the PCAP because who else reads PCAPs? Um, you know, it's one of those things. Um, and now, he was able over uh, a day to add an NFS table that instead of having to do NFS stat over and over and over again and grep it, just spits out a bunch of snapshots and is like, oh, that, that is the thing that's going up constantly. And that's the kind of thing that's really powerful about this. The other undergraduate we're working with has done something super cool, um, which is there is a Clang plugin, I guess, um, that someone built to start extracting things like the stuff in Q.H. He was actually working on OpenBSD. Um, it's a collaborator we worked with. But then one of our undergraduates took that, and now when he runs a kernel build, it extracts every single thing that is an S list, a tail queue. They just all get extracted as tables. And so there's 150 tables for me to go through when I get home. Because <laughs> we still have to have a human going like, that's good, that's bad. Um, so automatic structure extraction is useful because you think about this as, and what we now, what I now call this writ large is data tracing, right? So we're very used to doing function tracing, dtrace, BPF, a debugger, but generally we don't think about the data in a program as something that might be traced. Um, and what we want, the reason we want automated structure extraction is every time you build the kernel, you get a whole bunch of debug information that goes into dtrace and maybe you get all the tables. Right? And then you're like, oh, okay, now I can build my own tools without having to add 500 more uh, system calls. Uh, we're also looking at validation as a security mechanism because the, the relational algebra can be used to express constraints. So let's say you have a firewall. Well, currently firewall languages are ad hoc. You're like, oh, I happen to like the way these strings work in PF or IPFW or in whatever the thing is on Linux, IP filters. But if you were to actually use relational logic, you could express the constraints of what could go into the table in a way that could be mathematically understood. Um, 
looking about doing a dtrace provider so we can connect data tracing to function tracing. There is a Linux port, um, a nascent Linux port. I think it only does the proc table so far. Um, and they're looking at dbpf. We're looking at applications to containers. And I, I mentioned the application to the firewalls um, and other kernel tables that should access tables. So that's, that's what we're doing. Are there any questions? You have to come to the mic. Or, uh, he, oh, wait, we only have one mic. Um, if you go back to your slide where you showed the linear and super linear, and I guess I'd never notice when I run PS, I don't think PS naturally sorts, so you forced a sorting on it just to match your output, correct? What if you took that out and just accepted the native PS ordering? What's, what's that graph look like? So I actually don't have that graph with me, but it is still not as good because it's still dealing with strings. It's it is less super linear. Yeah, it's more like here. But it's like an offset. Does that answer your question? Uh, does it work on kernel core file? <laughs> no, but, no, but I like that. Uh, it does not, but we could do that because we've got the state. right? We could keep the snapshots. And actually, the snapshots would be in the kernel state and we could find them, but I'd have to hook it up to DDB to make it find it. Yeah, in my own experience, I was always wanted to do data tracing, usually on a dead kernel. I will take that down when we're done. Actually, you had your hand up. Do you want to go oh, yeah. next? Yeah, just a quick question. Something interesting work. Um, how do you deal with uh, structures that references other structure? How do you snapshot it? That's another paper. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, the, the question is, how do we deal with structures that reference other structures, which in FreeBSD, we do that all over the place. So there's the concept of a foreign key. Um, one of the nice things in the kernel is an address is unique, right? Like in, in process space, we can both have the same address in two programs. But in the kernel, it's like if the address is FFFF whatever, so we can use that as a foreign key. Um, but one of the things that is interesting and is part of the research is how do you find foreign keys and know they are foreign keys? And the problem with that is that is not automatable. In fact, so Avi, who's one of my advisors, did a ton of database stuff and, and the dinosaur book that we all know. <laughs> Avi's comment is, no, no, you can't derive that. God has to whisper in your ear. <laughs> I get really nervous when God is whispering in my ear because usually those people go out and like, you know, that it's a problem. Um, so we have not come up with a good solution to that. We can do it by hand. We'd be like, oh, this is a foreign key. But we haven't been able, we can't derive it automatically. So because you uh, do joins between different tables, when you take a snapshot, do you have to lock all the tables simultaneously? So that's like a, a giant lock? <laughs> or <laughs> because I, I wonder, like for example, for process table, right? If you would, if we would like to, sp because what we are seeing is uh, we have a problem with uh, scalability when we hit around like I think thirteen thousand processes, uh, the schedule really slows down. And this is because uh, the process uh, table has a single giant lock. And it's huge. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I wonder if uh, one, if we would like to like uh, split it between like multiple locks, then you would have to take all the locks, right? So it depends on the fidelity. So right now, because it's a research prototype, <coughs> which is what graduate students always say, um, we do just grab all the locks because it was the easy thing to do. I, I, not obviously, but we would have to do something very similar to what the kernel does. Like when you think about locking the routing table, right? So we'll lock the table, we find the route, we unlock the table, we lock the route, or we lock the route, we unlock the table, et cetera. We'd have to do that sort of flow um, to make it scale. Uh, right now, like if I locked all the 150 that um, Brian uh, extracted, I think the kernel would actually panic because we would take too many locks. And uh, there is no longer a giant lock, but I would have just taken that if I could have. <laughs> It's easy. So, uh, if you do an update, right, and uh, you, uh, this is where you compare the snapshots, and when you abort, basically the update fails. That's the idea, and there is no like a notion of something like select for update. 
where you could like reference? So <clears throat> that is part of the current. So this, obviously this paper went in months ago because papers don't get accepted quickly. Um, that is part of the current research. That's why we're trying to find out the, the foreign key stuff because there's a question of, so it's very interesting to work with database people. I mean, they're very, like my advisors are very smart people, but they don't code operating systems all day. So they don't, you know, I'm like, hey, what happens when this happens? Oh, so currently we're doing research where we try to figure out, and I've got sort of, three broad areas of where the asynchrony and volatility come in the system, and we're like, well, can we decide that a particular column, which is a particular part of a structure, is always okay, right? And that's currently gonna have to be decided by a human. Like, a kernel developer would be like, oh, that's probably okay. Um, but this time of check to time of use, so when you think about like killing a network daemon, eh, not so much of a problem because you know the graph is doing this. But where you're moving a, Thing between cores you could thrash. So do we include this column or don't we include this column? And under what conditions do we include the column? And that's what we're currently trying to work out now. You wanted to argue something. No, I'm not. I did say that last night, but I just said that because I know you. <laughs> um, no, I, the question I had was simple. On your future work for parsing um, uh, kernel data structures, that's something that would be very useful if we could get it in a semantic form for 32-bit stuff for on 64 or for emulating ARM on AMD 64 or whatever. Um, the question is, you know, that's kind of a, they sound similar. Is that something that might be a, pr a product that I could use or do I still need to f have a block of time to do that a similar sort of thing on my own? So the... The semantic versus syntactic question. So we can get the syntax out, obviously, because compilers do that. Right. The semantic question comes back to the foreign key question, comes back to the God whispering in your ear. Thus far, we have not come up with a good way to structure a set of rules that extract semantics. Now, last week, we discussed having one of the other graduate students who happens to work on machine learning, which I will only call machine learning, come up with a classifier. So it is possible that we will be able to classify certain things. We'll try that. Um, but that's very, very early. Syntax, I wouldn't say is easy. Syntax is straightforward. Semantics is very hard. Yeah. That's the same problem I'm going Yeah. That's very nice. I was hoping you'd solve this for me. <laughs> Not yet. Uh, I want to follow up on the topic that Pavel brought up. So about locking, and uh, so the locking mechanism can change. So for example, routing table is no longer locked uh, as it used to be. It's sure. now by Epoch, and PCBs are, and PCBs are protected by SMR, and this also can change. Uh, in, uh, so absolutely crazy idea. Uh, maybe John will say that this is possible or not. What if we run the thread, the kernel thread that fetches the data uh, in such a concept that it actually can dereference null pointer without a panic? Uh, so so uh, you, you catch that and you said that you cannot follow this uh, linked list. Uh, so, 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 so very much like throws exception, throws exception, catches exception, and then you can proceed all the data in kernel you got locklessly, uh, and gi gi give the user land a snapshot of everything. You you may have some stale data, mm -hmm. but you still exactly exactly, yeah. uh, and you are absolutely agnostic of what is the current locking of this particular subsystem. So only what needs to be done is a faultable, catchable context in kernel. <laughs> is it possible? <coughs> Holy camera, Adam, Mike. Um, that's fine. So, no, no, they, 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 they got me. Um, <laughs> I'm multitasking. Ah. Too many bad puns. Uh, so I'm trying to think. You could do something horrendous where, no, no, more horrendous, where you have a PCB on fault handler that long jumps to a jump buff that you um, have set jumped before. Uh, that might work. Um, the, the only trick is, well, normally we call PCB on fault in a way, like we've called it before we've done any locks or other resources or, oh, you want Go ahead, go for it, Ricky. Um, normally, we do PCB on fault 
pretty safely because we're, we're not acquiring any locks or anything yet. Um, so you could probably do a long jump from a PCV on fault handler. Uh, it's kind of interesting because all our current on fault handlers are written in assembly, but you could branch to long. You could branch to long jump. You need a global. And that kind of sucks. Um, that's how it works for DDB. So when DDB takes a fault when you're inside the debugger, um, we, we effectively do a set jump and we notice and we kind of do a manual PCB on fault equivalent. We notice we're in the debugger and we do a long jump back out to the global. So that part kind of sucks because finding the right jump buffer to use is kind of terrible. Maybe you could stick it in Kerr thread. You could probably do something where you stuck something in Kerr thread that's my current set jump buffer that you long jump back out to. Uh, no, but it, but it's actually probably pretty trivial to stick it, make it a per thread thing, and look it up because you can probably safely dereference per thread to find your jump buffer and your on fault handler, and still alter that in assembly. <laughs> yeah, you should. Yeah, yes. Yeah, you because you could you could uh, the same way with you with other data structures. You could you could in this world under some evil kernel option like I hate my kernel. Um, you I could. <laughs> <laughs> you you could statically allocate a jump buff with thread creation, so it always lives around with it. Uh, we do that with like turn styles and sleep keys now, so they always have a data structure that they can donate when they go to sleep. So you could do something where you you associate a jump buff with a thread all the time. It's always there. It's always allocated to living, so you can set jump on it before you do something ridiculous and turn on the and set a flag or something, which is if you get a fault, and so you can even not do it with PCB on fault. You can do the same places where in trap handlers we call KDB reenter. You could check to see, it's one of your magic, I'm in a special fault and I don't really want to fault, um, where I will basically long jump to the magic thing if my flag is set on my thread. So you could do that. Is there going to be a transcript of this? Because I need this. Yeah, I mean, there's a video. Okay, good. Uh, we're okay on time, right? So I was just wondering if you were looking at any changes to in kernel data structures to natively just support the version information similar to like what was motivated in the case of RCU where you're already making a copy anyway in order to be able to provide additional concurrency, you could merge those two things together in the most critical data structures or whatever that you want to be able to export. So, so on the flight here, I outlined five more papers I want to write and two of them include converting actual kernel data structures to SQLite tables. Um, so we are looking at that. I mean, of course, for me, it's all the examples are in the network stack because that's all I care about. Um, I mean, I hear that the kernel does other stuff, but those are the ones I know. Um, so we are looking at that, but that's a big lift. Um, and so there's a question about how we would do that. Sorry. Um, anybody else? Oh, one more. One more. So with, with the... Um, locking of everything, uh, I assume that's done all at the same time. And then uh, the question would be, if you have a system that's highly loaded, say doing a lot of networking data, um, what's the effect of that on the system? So at the moment, I cannot load the servers with enough stuff to make the kernel unhappy. Um, now, if someone wants to donate a $200,000 Ixia to Yale, then I will try to do that. Um, but on relatively, on relatively typical high-powered workloads, we just don't see that much trouble with the kernel. And at the moment, we're only locking seven tables or nine tables. Right? If we locked all 150 that have just been extracted, different things would happen. But the other thing to realize, and I have not gone over the extraction yet, I am pretty sure that 100 of the 150 tables are things that are in device drivers, right? So they're probably not in the main line of the kernel execution. Like the number of things that are like process table, the virtual memory, the, the things that are shared by everyone are probably the first 50. Um, so we'll, we'll see how bad that is. Um, but the other thing is that the snapshots are cheap. Like all we're doing is copying a bunch of integers. We're not copying, you know, like even struct proc is many K is it? It's it's not that big. No, no, no. Each each entry and <laughs> each entry in struct proc that you copy is not huge. And on a modern server, that's quick, right? Well, you need to lock the. We, we take all the all proc lock. Anyway, thank you. One more comment, because I. <laughs> oh, there were no more questions. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yes.
If you just grep for like tail queue head, you'll find a lot of things that you probably don't need to do, but some of them will be redundant. So for example, um, sleep queues and turnstiles both use a global hash table that all the entries that you have buckets of tail queues that we stick threads in, but you don't need any of that because when you look at a thread or well, actually look at a thread, you know what sleep channel it's on by the member of struct thread, like Ted Dubchan. Um, and the same thing for if it's blocked on a lock, you know that from a member of the thread. So some things um, we do in the kernel, we store the data multiple ways, and in your case, you only care, you only need it once. So there's actually probably many of those 150 things that not only, they might be device drivers, but the things you can ignore because they're a duplicate of what you already have. So the things that matter, it's probably much smaller. You probably have most of them already, honestly. Yeah, that's all hung off the process anyway. <laughs> all right, so, yeah, thanks, George. <laughs>